and welcome to North 100, a Canadian Highlander podcast. My name is Serge. Today, we've got a Nelly. Hey, I'm here. We got a Wheeler. God, it's been so long. We got a James on tech. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Just give your best Paul impression. Okay, that's pretty it's good. It's like he's in the room. Yeah, that's wow. Pretty good. Yeah. And a reminder that all this is possible thanks to you with your support of the Patreon over at patreon.com slash loading ready run. We're going to start with an oldie but a goodie. It's time for the best card you're not playing. Nelly. Guess what? The best card you're not playing is Aarakocra Sneak. That's right. From uh, Tales of... Commander Legends, Commander Baldur's, Legends Gate. <laughs> Baldur's Gate. Uh, it's three and a blue for a one four bird rogue with flying. And when Eric Hoker Sneak enters the battlefield, you take the initiative. So in the pantheon of initiative creatures, you know, it's not one of the cool rare ones. It's not the one that costs three mana, but it does have flying. It doesn't cost six mana. <laughs> It blocks one of their flying creatures pretty well, unless it's a four, four obviously, or more. But it still stops them from taking back the initiative uh, on its own. It'll, it'll, it'll stop one creature, unless that creature has a menace or whatever, um, from them taking back the initiative the next turn. And it's good at going and getting the initiative back again from your opponent. Um, I think in the current texture of initiative matters matchups, which is like if you have creatures and aren't necessarily a combo deck, um, then you care about the initiative a lot. And so just having more of these cards that can say, hey, I have the initiative now. I don't need to do combat because I'm casting this or I'm ephemerating this. Uh, just having more copies of the thing that gets the initiative right away rather than having to deal combat damage is important. And so you have to start really scraping the bottom of the barrel for every every initiative card that you can. You know, next one of these, maybe I'll be saying play Vicious Battle Gear. Um, <laughs> That's Robin's favorite uh, initiative it's creature. A, oh, there Vicious you go. Battle Rager? Yeah. Vicious think, Battle Rager. Sorry, yeah, Vicious he, Battle Rager. He thinks that's the best non, like... You know, white plume or CZ DZ one. It is. It's, yeah, it's a, a one, one five. five. So the thing, the thing that Battle Rager does, though, I was thinking about, is that like it blocks the four one skeleton that the initiative makes with any other creature, and like <laughs> the other creature has to die. Yeah. Instead of the one that you know uh, you can flicker for taking the initiative or whatever. So, uh, S- sneak and this one are very similar, though. Yeah, right? they're both yeah. kind of like, oh, I wouldn't think this was a constructed card until I finished reading the dungeon that you go until through until you die yeah. to the initiative and then yeah. you're like I want to play them all. Yeah. That that's the he- biggest part is that like the like you said the sneak keeps the initiative. Yeah. Yes. But just like in practice of you didn't get through my 1 4, you're probably not getting through my 3 6 flyer, <laughs> right? Right, right exactly. Like, it's just it's over. You need unholy heat or like swords to plowshares. Yeah. Well, How's it going? It's been a while. Welcome to a non-set review episode of North 100. I didn't know that we did these. <laughs> this this might be the first one you've actually done. First is this, one. Is this now, a spinoff? Now, first time? Yeah, exactly. yeah. Now, for viewers, don't look it up. Guess when you think the last one was. I'm going to give you a second to think about and put in your answer. Did you guess episode 127 recorded in August of 2021. Man. It's been a minute. It's been a hot minute. And that does not include the farewell to Jeremy White special, nor the welcome to North 100 uh, Nelly episodes. Yeah, sorry we've been holding out on you for so long. I'll live. (laughs) Yeah. Now, we do want to manage some expectations here. This is not the beginning of regularly occurring, regularly, regularly releasing non-set review episodes that being said we do want to record more of these so look forward to them showing up but we're not gonna we're not gonna commit ourselves to a new weekly bi-weekly or monthly schedule just when we're when we're vibing with it you know but -hmm. we know you want it we want to record it as well so look forward to that and for today's episode the theme is hey it's been a while let's check in with the format right and what better way to start with a check-in with the format than to visit the points list, a very foundational part of the whole everything that we do. And it's recently changed. And if Wheeler, if you'd be so kind as to recap the recent points changes. I can maybe do this off the top of my head. Oh. Oh. I'm going to talk about the increases first. Okay. Um, 
Here's a big one. Ancestral Recall went from seven points to eight points. Here's an even bigger one. It's still really good. (laughs) Yeah. Turns out that uh, one of the best cards you can play in this format is still one of the best cards that you can play in this format. If I may, Mm -hmm. is that the most expensive pointed card ever, or is it still tied with Flash historically? There, There was a point in time historically where Flash was technically there was a time when flash was like 10 points was it, was it 10 out of 14 points points you could have yeah. 10, out of 10. I, like I part remember. of this you got to understand highlander has these like periods of time where the only like recorded evidence is like in a magazine <laughs> tucked away in the rotting in someone's we, attic we tell the stories it's 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 preserved in oral tradition exactly so it is i want to say more or less, yes, it is tied with Flash, which at one point in time was eight points. Um, although Flash may have been ten points. Uh, <laughs> if like you were ten points, yeah. if you come in not wearing a hat or whatever, <laughs> you know, rules we had. Hell, it was feeling it. spicy that day. Yeah. Maybe you weren't allowed your ninth and tenth point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's 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 eight points until your fourth match, and then if it's after ten p.m., suddenly it's ten. points. If you make it to the final, yeah. sorry, yeah. Yeah. it's ten. If it won last week, all right. Yeah. So ancestral's eight. Yeah, uh, fourth Aerolingus, a new card added to the points list. Now one point. Uh, also a relatively new card from Lord of the Rings: Tales of Middle Earth, uh, Commander product. Uh, not a real magic card. Just unbelievably, why the hell does this exist? Yeah. It's For those that don't know, it's X red and a white for a sorcery. You create X 2-2 two, two human knight tokens with trample and haste. And whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to one or more players this turn, you become the monarch. This card is good no matter which stage of the game, whether you're on the uh, beat, whether you are uh, in a winning position or even defensively, it's quite good. Um, it just ends games too quickly, too easily, snowballs way... It's just, this is the best blue card that has been printed in quite some time. So, yeah, this card is... It's very funny, because you look at this mana cost, and uh, this card's actually blue or green. Hmm. It's not Boros, until it's in the Boros deck, and, you know, then it's Boros, but, yeah. uh, Busted magic card. Uh, Then the cards that have been decreased, I will now... Use that's much better than looking at your crotch, Nelson. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to hide the you know, bir- yeah, yeah. Birthing pod has been reduced to zero and removed from the points list. That was a big ask. Uh, I was the one holdout from getting that removed for a while because flashbacks of old of old Pat Pod, probably you, like what? talking about this and the bounding crises are still like running around in your brain. Um, I birthing pod is really cool until you play with it. And then it's not, or Birthing Pot is really cool until you play with it or until your opponent just like mucks everything you do. Um, and then it, it's it's this really awkward card, I guess, to have running freely. But Creature Combo is something that needed a little bit of a boost. Uh, and this is a way to boost it. Not to mention, it's a card that people play uh, poorly all the time. And that's cool. It's cool that people now see that this card is something they can include in their deck and experiment with really bad pod decks or decks that have no reason to play birthing pod. Just fair pod. Yeah, but that's that's good. You want, from like a format curation point of view, you want people to experiment and have fun and maybe spike a one tournament and then they're like, oh my God, I, I did it. I broke the game. It's workshop pod. <laughs> like, how, of course it is, you know? Um, Gifts Ungiven got lowered to one point from two. That's a four mana card and it uses the graveyard, uh, often to set up its kills. So, uh, while it does often just win the game when you cast Gifts Ungiven, it requires a lot of deck building restraints, uh, as well as the zones it uses are pretty, uh, you can interact with it more than something like intuition. Uh, so we've kind of put them on the same level. Umezawa's Jite is now one point uh, down from two. Uh, I was against the Jite going to two in the first place. I wasn't on the council at the time. That was during my break. That change literally made me go, no, nope, not doing this. I'm getting back on the council. Um, <laughs> that was years and years ago, though. Yeah, That's that was a couple of years. Really really I think that was a couple of years ago now. Um, I thought two, just one and two a half, for- I want to oh, say. Okay, okay. Um, and uh, yeah, I like Jite one. I think the big like banner for this is that one point cards should matter. One point cards are cool. They are fun for customization. They make deck building more interesting. They make 
Uh, Highlander is about convincing people that their decisions matter. And one point cards are great at doing that. Sometimes it's easier than not to convince them, but like you get to be the person that goes, hmm, I picked GTA as my one point card and it won me all my games. Right. Instead of like cruise or managering or whatever. Uh, Spellseeker went down to two flash got a huge buff and, and therefore its points got increased. Uh, the creature combo decks that use seeker like Kiki pod and seeker walk, uh, needed a little extra juice and spell seeker was like, you know, paying for the crimes of flash and time walk in the first place. Uh, natural order got reduced to two. I am still a little hazy about this because natural order is a broken magic card. People are like, well, you only get crater hoof behemoth or prime time. It's like, no, you get whatever card you need. Yep. And that's broken. Um, but at the same time, it's hard out there being creature combo in a world of pyrokinesis and fury and everything else. Elvish Arch Druid decks could use a little. Workout. Yeah, I'm not upset yeah. throwing a bone to them. Yeah. Demonic Tutor got lowered to three points. You can still DT Lotus uh, without having to worry about Yogmoth's Will or Underworld Breach causing some issues. And uh, it's a nice consideration for two color mid range decks or for other decks that might default to three mocks and wanting to have that ability to find a silver bullet. Uh, and then finally, Strip got lowered down to two uh, from three points, which is, it's debatable whether or not more people strip mining each other is like a good thing, but it's something that will at least give, incentivize different point spreads in the decks that were already playing strip mine uh, and pushes people to maybe revisit some of these mid-range decks that had the lands package that got pushed out by the initiative. Um, and also just, I'm so sick and tired of triumphs, just a, a front to God. <laughs> and so strip mining a triome is, you know, that is, you're, you're doing, you're doing good. I was just to say more answers to Academy is always really good. Oh, uh, I mean, we don't need to talk about that. <laughs> I mean, we will talk about yeah. that, but I, we don't need to talk I kind of like the strip lowering, absorbing the point in the fourth <laughs> lingus decks. Some of them. Mm, yeah. 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 I do definitely want to frame this conversation around what this is going to change as the decks as opposed to why didn't this card get pointed or not. And I think that's an excellent way to look at that. Yeah. I cannot wait to put bad pod in all of my decks. Yeah. Uh, I One of my pet decks that I've played for a very long time has been recurring nightmare decks. This Abzan sort of grindy sort of deck like that. Mm -hmm. And... It's always important when you play a deck with Green Sun Zenith and Finale of Devastation to have a good spread of threats all the way up your mana curve mm -hmm. so that you're, you can ask yourself, what can I answer at this turn? What can I answer at this turn? Um, Timeless Witness versus... What's the four mana one? Eternal Witness is a three mana one. Timeless Witness is Eternal a Witness one. and Timeless Witness being great examples of like the same sort of hits at different points of the mana curve that you can hit. Mm -hmm. And that deck already has a really good way of utilizing etbs and now free pod just makes me start thinking like maybe this deck is a serious contender yeah and then that with free crop rotation from the previous points changes and suddenly i'm just the happiest man alive and if we want to talk about decks that have changed over the history of the format specifically around points as the premier lands pilot nope. format no nope. you cannot imagine what it was like trying to run a lands deck 10 years ago when crop rotation was pointed, wasteland was pointed, crucible was pointed, um, light from the loam was pointed. Oh my God. Y'all have no idea how good you have it now, says old boomer shouting at the clouds. Well, it's, yeah, I'm not, I'm absolutely not defending those pointings. They were atrocious. Uh, Nelson should try to defend them. You were a part of it. <laughs> you, you, you're the, you're the counselor that brought crop rotation up to one. Ten years ago, crop rotation was free. And that one, yeah, crop rotation to one for that point in time was the correct thing to it do. It was fine. It, yeah, yes. it was Light, actually fine. When Life from the Loam and Crucible of Worlds were points, that, uh, you <laughs> know, wasteland? that was a, that was more than ten years ago. Wasteland is somewhat defensible. I'm not saying you should point wasteland, but you could see a world where wasteland at one is something a feature of this format. Yeah, right. The thing is, like, I will defend all of these points <laughs> arguments, and I want anyone who starts a new format um, and uses anything like a points list or a band list 
to sculpt it and try to create fun experiences for everybody and try to meet the needs of their local community and try to make sure that everyone can uh, agree on a on a playing field and come and have a fun tournament together every Monday night that it's hard and you're going to make some mistakes and if especially if you have no experience with it you're probably going to start with something like the Australian seven point list where they play 60 cards but was a resource you could have online and then you just compare that to the two decks that have been playing against each other because they're the two people that play in your shop every week mm-hmm. and you're trying to like turn their match into like something fair and on the one hand it's just blue green like old <laughs> cheap stuff like there's a couple rares in there but mostly it's like days and trigon predator werebear and yep. werebear and you're like okay well i'm not really going to point anything in your deck except the ancestor recall and the time walk you probably shouldn't be able to play both of those in the same deck right but on the other hand the, the other deck that was at the very beginning of the islander format was just like tinker slash busted stuff it was just like what are all the most design mistake cards in magic and like Life from the Lone Crucible were in there. So it's like, okay, well, maybe if we could just shut off the strip mine lock part of your deck, and then we put some points on Tinker, but like, you know, we can't let you have all of both of those things. And then we, you know, maybe we do something about the memory jars that are in that deck. We point the moxes, you know, I'm just sympathetic to myself at that stage of the game. Mm -hmm. That's That's my defense. Great. Yeah. The format's changed. Well, hundreds of people play it now rather yeah. than hundreds all over no, thousands, thousands of tens of thousands tens of thousands, of thousands. So then the question yeah. then is how is the format feeling is it is it healthy is it in a good place are you in a good place hmm. uh if we filmed this like a month ago uh if we filmed this before these changes i would say that the format's in a trash spot hmm. uh now i think it's much better I said, those like those little knobs have gone from terrible to good it was like eight cards on the list or something right like a ton of there's cards. been a ton of changes uh, in the past year like i the think canlanders i mean canlander is in a spot where no matter what the actual health of the format at the most competitive level is uh will always be an enjoyable format to play uh with friends at a table or like uh as an eight person tournament or whatever right once you try to once you get to into min maxing then you realize that you should be playing Black Lotus or Jeskai. And like, that's it. Hmm. Um, and that was the case for quite some time. Uh, or sorry, that was, that that's always kind of been the case, but like it really kind of got ground uh, into you over the printing period of Modern Horizons 2, Lord of the Rings, uh, Commander Legends, Baldur's Gate, hmm. with the introduction of those cards, uh, where there are, there were so many snowballing cards and effects that just led to non games and decisions not really mattering. Um, changes to get rid of those, including dipping the toes, your toes into the water of like, hey, fourth Aerolingus is like just a good card, right? When's the last time we printed pointed just a good card? It's like true name nemesis. Yeah, we had Jace the Mind Sculptor on there for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Like it's been yeah. a while. It's been a while. Like 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. We don't point just good cards that much. It's yeah. usually like some kind of combo. So there's life. a step in the direction of re- recognizing that, like, yeah, make people play different cards or pay a premium on these snowbally things. We're not quite there yet. The council has been voting on stuff like Minskinboo, Timeless Heroes, and White Plume Adventurer, and discussing Urza Saga and whatnot. But you know, this is a big sweeping change that makes the format more interesting to play uh fewer instances of getting ran over um and tests the waters for like how people react to pointing the good stuff cards and i guess the fact that fourth aerolingus has like shown up in tournament winning decks like consistently since it hit one point is probably a pretty good sign that this was the right call you know yeah i i do miss early highlander but current Highlander is also, uh, especially with the changes, uh, fun and good. Yeah, uh, I've seen a bunch of different decks. Uh, I've only played in my local game. I haven't played very much uh, among the water community, although we did get a bunch of games in, in Vegas. And so that's not super recent. I'm talking about MagicCon Vegas 2023. It was in, the, in September. But uh, lots of uh, really interesting brews happening around... Um, you know, established 
tutors but with like sort of new end game combo pieces and synergies like the i met some other people that were building towards the food deck that we've talked about on the podcast a few times um between the wilds of eldraine cards care about food and lord of the rings food cards and so um that's like an exciting design space and then um the shape of the the mid-range decks i'd say it's like and the, then the creature decks i want to sympathize that maybe it has seemed like a little bit uh trash or like getting towards <laughs> narrowness right yeah. so these changes are exciting uh to me although weirdly it's like it feels so weird saying that like a triple mox jitte spread might be the good guy now because like <laughs> that was like specifically a boogeyman from like yeah you know 10 years ago um but that's kind of an exciting spot where it's just like maybe if you're not completely devoted to um casting your own fourth air lingus there's still going to be a path for you to like do busted stuff and as you say have your decisions matter so my read right now and i haven't i haven't even played one tournament since the points changes they're very new um but my read right now from the last couple tournaments i've played is that the format is in a pretty good spot where a lot of different deck designs can win the tournament one of the things that has been interesting in my more limited experience is how creature dominated the format feels right now, how much creatures matter. And it has pushed out some of the old archetypes that I really love to play. Like I used to love all in lands combo, which is maybe worth revisiting now. We'll see how it goes. But lands went from being an all in deck to a creature matters with a lands package it was like the, the, the better way to play the lands deck. And then the prison decks of my heart they just can't keep up with how aggressive and how much of a clock that the creature decks can push out right now which is not to say that that's a bad thing but it it does change the format in interesting ways tempo is struggling control is struggling we got to help out combo a little bit do you want me to dip my toes into the initiative right now uh that's something I, we might we might say for an entire whole episode. So you can let us know in the comments if you want to see that. But the initiative is has really warped things, I feel. Yeah, not in the way that you would expect Please. or that most people would expect. Okay. Which is probably why if we do get to doing a whole episode for it, well that's the reason why because there's sure. a lot of explaining. Yeah. But I it does like it, talking about what you mentioned where you feel like the land stack all in combo lands had to get pushed to playing creatures mm. is that I think it's, it's because of the initiative, it's almost gone back where you have, like you said, it was just better to turn tireless tracker sideways and then occasionally uh, combo kill people instead of looking to combo kill people and use tracker as like a draw engine. Yep. Um, but now because the initiative cards are so powerful for mid range decks and because they not just the initiative cards, but other board based threats have caused control decks to kind of control mid range and tempo to kind of homogenize into this single entity that when you're recording deck lists, I just call it by the shard or the wedge, like just guy control didn't win just guy tempo or mid range didn't win just guy won. Mm. you know, um, because of all that, it's starting to push in the other direction where at least locally the like lands decks that have had the most success are these frankly monstrosities, be it like Jacob Varro's uh, Thoracle Enchantress lands combo, which earned him uh, like three tournament wins uh, with that deck in particular, or uh, there's another pilot uh who is relatively new to the format, but not new to magic locally that has been playing what on the surface level looks like a re combination between a commander deck and a vintage cube deck. Um, but it is like, no, I'm just going to kill you with these field of the dead tokens and lock you out with glacial chasm. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's kind of going back. Okay. Like My in heart, it's which fluttering a little. I empathize with you. I wish I could play blue green again. Like <laughs> that summer where I won three tournaments in a row with blue green tempo splashing for Sphinx's revelation. That feels like a bit that doesn't feel real at all. <laughs> that doesn't sound like a current deck. Yeah. But it is kind of interesting to see like change is also interesting. Yep. Right. For and sure. to see it somewhat like, um, I don't want to use the word organically, but to see archetypes evolve, given the conditions 
and kind of warp to like w- they survive right to how they can survive if you're addicted to zurin orb you're going to play the version of zurin orb decks that can like get around board based strategies and that's kind of cool it's an interesting spot to play a eternal format Mm -hmm. where you get to play the most powerful cards of all time and then to see it getting impacted by modern cards you're like oh how much of a shake-up can you have right because you're like at first you're thinking oh i get to play the most busted old cards you know the the design mistakes and then you're like wait no everything is just really good now and back and forth i I mean my favorite part is when uh, an unexplored archetype suddenly gets more support. Mm-hmm. Uh, Merfolk being a great example of something that just wasn't possible back then. And it's not like they've made egregious errors. You just suddenly get more cards to make archetypes that previously weren't competitive, now competitive. And that's yep. fun. That deck seems like it must be close to or added. I've said this on the podcast before, but a critical density that... Uh, can make it a contender. I haven't faced anyone playing it, but I I, I fear that Merfolk is you know ready to rear their ugly head. For people who watch Showdown, please don't base Merfolk <laughs> on my on my piloting of it. I have had uh, not a great run with that particular list, and I think it's better than I've done a job good job of demonstrating. I it. did I did take Merfolk to a tournament. Um, I guess in this was late 2022, okay. where I won that event by usurping the uh, Jeskai pilot um, who was on like a 17 match win streak or something. Like they were on a heater and then it was so demoralizing for them that they just couldn't win another. Like I, I back to back them in the finals and then they just, they were just on tilt, like messaging me being like, Oh, I can't believe you did this. (laughs) Thomas. Okay, called out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all yeah. right. Yeah. He loves it. Hi, Thomas. Hi, Thomas. <laughs> Serge, can I ask, have you considered taking your love of prison cards and then just like pulling the blinders down a little bit and letting yourself, or like, you know, putting, pulling, yeah, the blinds, like to, you know, pull, pull the wool over your eyes a little bit and then just look at all the white death and taxes cards and see the similarities, right? Sure. sure you I, don't I have to be a D&T player this whole time. Well, it's I like, mean... you know, it's your upkeep. Sure. You don't have to sacrifice a permanent, but your opponent couldn't cast anything last turn because their, their, the man is not hold, there. Hold yet. on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Have you played D&T before? I have not. It just, it, I think the thing is, the, the people <laughs> at R&D, like the people making the magic cards, they look at all the stacks and prison cards and they're like, well, we don't do that anymore because we want the game to be fun. And But they, th- they're still working there and they make white creatures that cost two and three mana. If I may, first off, we'll just leave, let, <laughs> let Wheeler cook a little <laughs> bit. On. Okay, okay, okay. You're there just is, putting together there's a very real... Uh, prison list that I piloted to great success on Showdown against Wheeler. Okay. It was, <laughs> yeah, it uses uh, the curses, curse pox. Okay. Yeah, small pox, pox, pox. What did I What did I hit you with? Death Cloud? Death I got Death Cloud into the dirt. Nice. I Death yeah. Clouded him for three on like turn two. It was beautiful. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the aura curse is great there because in actually in Amonkhet, they brought back a couple of like the game ending seven mana curses. All your creatures are one ones. Right. Uh, take five damage every turn. If you can't sacrifice everything, there's a couple of them. So that deck's in a kind of a real spot. I, I have another prison deck that I think you'll like that ties into a previous point that we talked about. Mm. But I got to say, I got to get this out of my system. The fact that you haven't played d and and yet you like stripping people into the dirt, locking them out with taxation effects, and putting equipment on bad creatures. Like, you can do all that, but better yeah. in one deck. And, so, you and it's like the best it. deck in That's, the format. If, if, it's, if it's, I may, I've been intimidated to pilot. It is. I, I, I've, I see it as being a very technical deck. And I don't know if you know this about me. I'm a very emotional player. Mm-hmm. Where my my mindset is not consistent. I'm not a very analytical player. And so depending who I sit across from or who I'm playing, uh, my ability to pilot a deck varies wildly. It's all over the place. And um, Mac Mm -hmm. commented a long time ago that he actually would use that against me. Because if he brought intensity, I would match intensity. 
and I'd play really well. But if he showed up and he's like, hey, how you doing, buddy? And he, <laughs> and he just kind of relax and chill. I would also relax and my state of play would relax. And he's just like, Serge, on a good day, you have business beating players you have no business beating. And on a bad day, you lose to players you have no business losing against. And I was just like, man, I wish I could have that upstairs and I don't. And so a, a deck that requires a very high level of consistent play, I realize isn't for me. So I just play wacky high variance decks because I'm a wacky high variance player. Okay, okay. But I should learn how to play S DNT. Speaking of wacky high variance, yeah. there's an archetype that we talked about quite a bit before... Uh, we went on a two-year coma um, <laughs> that has a, huh? gone through such an interesting evolution path, and it's get and this will be a treat for everybody. Get your hands ready. It's a deck with ancient tomb mana, medium red. So medium red was like the best deck in the format for like a month where <laughs> Mana Crypt and Soul Ring were just like not properly pointed. Right. right? Me medium red, and kudos to you for uh, devising this archetype. It was not just you? I, I don't want to take full credit for okay. this. Nathan Hogman was like... Yes, that's right. I, I think that I helped refine it. But Hogman was like a day one -er right. for just like but the two of you. And then there was another person who built a copy pretty quickly soon, too. Like the 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 archetype kind of hit the local scene like a meteor. Like it was yes. like so suddenly you'd never heard of this this deck before. And then the next month it was like, oh, you need Rattle to masters everywhere. Yeah. You need to expect yeah. to play against this deck like yeah. week in, week out. It was what that deck did. It was my impression was just like it allowed all the like, you know, cool like older you know coffee sipping uh like thinks highly of themselves magic players to go like oh i can play mono red yeah and like i don't feel i don't there's no <laughs> self-hating guilt associated with it or whatever i can just let myself play good cards mm -hmm. but also it also had a bunch of really exciting lines of play so medium red quite good a lot of points happened to it uh happened upon it i yeah. guess um which impacted its ability to have these nuts draws but still a pretty good deck. It's hard, like when you draw your Ancient Tomb, you're killing your opponent. Um, but then the evolution into Gruel Monsters, uh, which kind of became me me the medium red right. deck. Medium like it was a uh, deck that had fast acceleration, Ancient Tomb mana, played these powerful three drops, but then it's four drops instead of being like, Hellrider, Hero of Oxid Ridge style cards, which I don't even think are in most medium red decks anymore. Uh, they got to play cards like Questing Beast and Minsk and Boo Timeless Heroes. And then if they want, they could still play these Hellrider cards or dragons. Um, and I, I constantly would say that Gruel Monsters was a deck that Boomer Magic players couldn't build because you just kept look you have to just include only cards from the past couple of years mm. like the creatures are just you try to be like hmm maybe i should play uh blastoderm or whatever and it's like no 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 perhaps <laughs> a storm breath dragon yes, this exactly. evening pogafos and yeah. then gruel monsters kind of turned into uh much to my chagrin naya monsters or naya midrange or just gruel that played white for comet fourth aerolinga seasoned engineer that kind of thing um, but then it's looped back to like Naya's still good, Gruel is still good. They're they're their own things now. But then Medium Red has popped up again, and it's just slaughtering people left and right, either locally or on uh, the Discord or the like other. Uh, I think in the Portland community, there's a Medium Red player that like at the, all the Port Portland weeklies is just either winning or coming in second. Turns Maybe I'm wrong. Blood but Moon's a heck of a card. Yes, and so is Inti, Seneschal of the Sun, mm. and so is... You think Inti is making that much of a splash, a little humble two-drop, eh? I think Inti might be... this In a world where we got Lord of the Rings released, yeah. Inti might be a top five card. You want to cover it really quickly for people who might not be I? familiar? One in a red for a 2-2 two -two legendary human knight. Whenever you attack, you may discard a card. When you do put a 1-1 one -one counter on target attacking creature, it gains trample. Stop. Whenever you discard one or more cards, exile the top card of your library. You may play that card until your next end step. So this is from the latest um, Ixalon. Yes, LCI. Yes, thank um, you. So Inti is a magic card that is very easy to cast, will always do something, converts resources you don't need into immediate damage and resources down the line, uh, works with other cards that care about discarding, 
and just happens to be a human, which is also relevant, and on a single pip. Like, it's just... <sighs> if you if you'd really wanted a new card, that was the beginning of the episodes. My first time doing a best card you hadn't played, and I was like, "Oh, does it need to be a new card?" Because I think this conversation about the initiative is ultimately more important. But mm-hmm. like, this was going to be the one. If it was like, it has to be a card from the last couple sets. Like, this is real breakout card. And in addition to Inti, and this will be my slide to the prison deck. I think you'll like is Docks or Broadside Bombardiers. Ooh. Do you know this card, Serge? I do not. I don't know oh, this card. Oh, get, we. I forgot to include this on the LCI set review. This is the command but card I, from LCI, right? But I think it's like the best card from the set. Oh, really? So it's two and a red for a goblin pirate. It's a 2-2 two, two with menace and haste, and it has boast. You sacrifice another creature or artifact. Broadside Barmadiers deals damage equal to two, plus the sacrifice permanence red mana value to any target. <laughs> yeah, so... Gross. What? So... Throw it <laughs> only if this creature attacked yeah, this boast. turn yeah. and only once each turn. Yes. Okay, I didn't That's know what, boast. Sorry, yeah. I didn't know what boast okay. meant. So yeah. I had to, I had to read that. I thought maybe yeah. that was a like landfall, like a keyword ability that didn't actually mean anything. So I no. had to be like, hold on, time out. So yeah, attack, throw my winter orb at you. And it has menace. And it has menace. Throw any creature. Uh, play a flame tongue kavu. Get rid of your second blocker. Attack. Uh, dome you <laughs> for six. Yeah. Is Take this, an additional two. Is this why medium red is so... Busto it, right now. I, mean, I had not seen this card before. This is wild. It's certainly in addition to any of the ancient tomb decks. Um, and I died a lot to a mono red prison deck. I was going to say, what, where's the? Tell me about the prison version of this. So it very, it was very similar to medium red in that it played uh, cards like Dockside, or sorry, Broadside Bombardiers. It had Lelia, had Inti. Um, it basically resembled the like moon blood moon stompy lists from legacy. But instead of trying to like match the numbers of playing like this many creature, like this percentage of creatures or whatever, they just said like, no, these are all the creatures I'd play. And then the rest is just burn and taxation and like tangle wires and thorns. And it's just turns out you get a goblin rabble master in play and then prevent your opponent from casting another spell. It just kills you. That's pretty good. So there is prison out there. We just kind of have to change the what sure. we think prison is going to be. If if I may take it in a, in a slightly weirder direction, is it kind of like how CDH calls stacks? Yeah, it's closer to that. Not quite as perverse, but... Sure. <laughs> yeah. We haven't quite lost all meaning of the original definition with that one? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Red in taxes, maybe? Interesting. Yeah. yeah I've never played DNT. I think you'd like it. It's fun. And it's a difficult deck, but like the floor, if you are new or um, this isn't a targeted jab, uh, not good at the game. Mm. uh, It's a great deck to jump into the format and then become good at the game. Yeah. Because it's going to teach you real quick what you care about. Yeah. Yeah. I taught myself how to sequence through like pox. (laughs) <laughs> oh, which is a which is an odd way to try and learn how to play magic yeah i want to sympathize that if you get into an archetype that's already established you copy a deck list from a deck that won a tournament or whatever you are it's it's inevitable to try to like compare your own plays your own mulligan decisions your own sequencing choices to like the best players that have piloted that you've seen or that mm. you know about but it's important to remember that they all started from square oh, no, one with sure. that deck at some point too. And so like, you know, every deck, whether even if it's, you know, red deck wins or thoracal combo, you know, l- l- let yourself be kind to yourself. Let yourself go through the early stages of making the mistakes and learning how, how to play those decks because they're fantastic decks and you deserve it. Training wheels is training playing cards that are training wheels in your deck uh, are it's not embarrassing. Because uh, learning isn't an embarrassing thing, nope. and winning is not as well. And those cards yeah. tend to help both those. But what happens yeah. if I play a top eight deck, but I don't have a top eight performance, and I feel bad about myself? Uh, then you... Milkshake. Milkshake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mil- milkshake. Yeah. All right. So real quick check-in sort of mm-hmm. at the end here. How how are y'all? You've been good? How's your Highlander experience? Oh. You you feeling good about yourself and the format in, in general? No, I played six events last year and won only one of them. That's mm-hmm. trash. I played like three events last year and won zero of them. So maybe if I'll need to tell myself if I played three more, maybe I would win one. I do. Um, yeah, I, I plan on playing more this year. I 
it's obviously difficult because my my life kind of imploded and I don't get to live in Victoria anymore and I don't really have a, a Highlander scene where I'm living. Mm -hmm. But I want to make a an actual tournament run at some point because mm -hmm. I just the only when the only magic you play is on camera. And when 99% of it is against Ben Wheeler, it kind of warps both the way you play and your expectations is what a metagame is. Dude, camera magic is so difficult. It is a whole different beast. It is, I mean, not to, I can't believe I'm going to praise Surge, uh, but when this man's not playing on camera, it's a lot, it's a whole different game. And the same goes for myself, <laughs> mm. right? Like, and and Nolly and yeah. everybody playing, playing camera, camera magic is, is hard. It is so difficult to do. Yeah. Um, and like playing in paper at tournaments or like jam sessions, completely different story. And that feels great. It was very funny. I recently recorded. I mean, we recorded a while ago, but it recently went live. A game of Canadian Highlander against the Spike Feeders. Mm -hmm. And so many of the comments are like, "Man, why did Surge like play like that against Wheeler?" <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> Just suddenly change it because I came out swinging and, and things went really well there. Mm -hmm. It's just like I, nice. I can play. Wheeler's just really good at the game. Well, I don't know. He I'm does a little play washed. that way against Wheeler. You're all washed up these days. I, I yeah, I, I'm embracing how washed I am and playing <laughs> Rat Scam. Instead. That Rat Scam deck was sweet. Yeah, it was that ruled. <laughs> yeah, but you know, yeah. But we'll see. I do think I'm going. I mean, I'm playing this Monday. I'm going out for my first tournament since. Before the pandemic, Ooh. I'm going out and I'm jamming and I'm looking forward to, I don't make um, New Year's resolutions or anything like that, but mm -hmm. I do really want one more push of getting in there and doing a little bit of a competitive grind. And if I can get my life in order and move back to Victoria in time, I'd, I'd love to be uh, the player in our group who, com you know, who qualifies for the top eight. And then scrubs out early and joins the commentary booth, you know, for a change. Well, I mean, there's open room. I didn't even get to qualify. I don't even have a chance to scrub out this year, which I would have. <laughs> Let's be clear. I still love the game. I find it a lot harder to stick around for a whole tournament now. My, like, mm -hmm. internal clock tells me that, like, 8 p.m. is kind of bedtime just because, yeah. like, sure. my, the you know, kids. Yeah, I'm getting up yeah. early and, like, you know, my partner wants to spend time with me and stuff. So it's like, most evenings I'm working and then a Monday night uh, when we're not, when I'm not doing like a CTS stream or something, it's like, okay, I'd like to go play Highlander, but it means both I have to like foist all the bedtime responsibilities on my wife and then also like get to round three or like the end of round two. And I'm just like, <clears throat> I can't even really focus. <laughs> and magic's hard and Highlander's like extra hard magic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just, yeah, just like between having kids and the pandemic and then like getting back into it. It's been a pretty rocky start for me, but I still have enjoyed going out and playing. So last year I played at least one event with mono black aggro. And I think I started two Oh, and then lost to Noel. Oh, that yeah. was a good night. Like oh, that was fun. Who did you dumpster? You I dumpster good... Spencer. That was so good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. Like I he won the game. He won the game. He cast fourth with Aerolingus, but he only had it in one of three games. Oh my God. I remember yeah. watching the him just like draw me like, Hmm. <laughs> I pr I said things during that match that uh, the judge in me, the older judge in me, would have been like, "You please you don't comment. Up. Please yeah. don't comment <laughs> yeah. on this." But it's just squatting over his hand, be like, "Huh? Was oh, that going to be good? Oh no, that that dice to that. Oh, oh no." <laughs> yeah. A little bit of uh, friendly trolling going on mm. across the table. I'm sure he still played fine. Like, it was still close. Mm -hmm. uh, and then lost to Noel, and I was like, great, I can go home now. Yeah. <laughs> like, which which is not, like, a fantastic feeling to have when you're in a tournament. It's like, you should be there, like, wanting to win or at least wanting to play all the matches. Well, I mean, this is what Wheeler sort of opened with. This is still a format that's just fun to play, even not competitively. Yeah, Just that's to fair. show up, and the community in Victoria is pretty tight-knit. It is like you're just catching up with some buds. Yeah. And so, I mean, there's very few formats that I would excitingly go out and owe to milkshake in every week. Right. Right. Yeah. Because you're you're there to have fun. You're there to see how your brew is doing or what the metagame is like or how people are doing. And then sometimes you get ranched and that's OK. You have a milkshake and you try again next week. Yeah. The there's a 
several groups of people that just like get together and you know weekly and do like jam sessions at like the board game cafe or somebody's mm-hmm. house and that is just like you get lost in doing that you just you start playing highlander with your friends and you're talking about weird brews and then all of a sudden you've been there for six hours your phone <laughs> has like eight notifications your husband's like so are you dinner? making dinner or <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. No, that's awesome. Um, I also brought that uh, that Scape Turns deck mm-hmm. to a tournament, and I think I, again came kind of close to making a finals or something. I think I got. Oh yeah, I got into a round four where if I won, I think this is right. I think if I got to a round, f- I, maybe I went to one and one. I can't remember, but it was it was good. I had I had fun. I, so the yeah. few tournaments I've played this year have been a good time. I under I, I get that. I, I treat yeah. tournaments more like single limb now. Right. Where it's yeah. like, people are like, oh, you didn't get that trophy, so you're going home. It's like, no, it's 9 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I want my jammies on. I'm just trying to, like, make myself, like, because I've played so many tournaments in my life and, like, had this attitude where I'm like, yeah, I'm going to win this thing and get mm-hmm. more prizes than I put in or whatever. And, like, I think going forward, this is the, the year I'm not making a New Year's resolution either, but, like, I just need to change my mindset to be like, you know, five, ten bucks or whatever to go play in a tournament. Go two zero, drop, go home. Like that's a good night. You're yeah. allowed to do that. I, it's fine. I definitely had a uh, moment where I played in a tournament and I like I'm two zero, and then I lose the third round. I'm like, I couldn't get. I could play another round, hang out with friends, and like get you know whatever amount of store credit or whatever. Right. Or I could just go home and you know, uh, eat some food get really high and play a vintage league on magic online and tell myself I'm not totally washed up. And that feels great. But if I won that and then, yeah, I'll just stick it out to the finals. That'll be great. Yeah. Yeah. A balance. You need a nice balance. I certainly, uh, yeah, I've, I, in the matches I played, I didn't have any bones against any of my opponents or their decks or like where the, where the format is right now. Like, I think the, uh, even though there's been like more health or less health throughout the months and like this last 14 months, there have been a bunch of like pretty tumultuous points change, like pretty serious. Like we talked about the, uh, December 30th ones, but there was also a points change, like very end of November or very beginning of December. Like there was a, we hit, like, yeah. right? or was it, maybe it was October, but it was like recent. Yes. Um, and it was also a lot of cards. So, um, yeah, kudos to yourself and all the counselors working on that um, and the local community. A lot of fun. I know we're looking to wrap up, but I do want to give one massive shout out to uh, everybody playing this format outside of Victoria, which is now just like, like it is the amount of people that play this format is Way more than we could ever expect back when we were just jamming 16-person sure. events. Because yeah. there are weekly tournaments that get more a larger attendance than uh, YJ does. That's great. Out, you know, it, yeah. And it's not just in the States or Canada. You got uh, p- folks in Europe playing. There are groups of people. You know, There are groups of really uh, just fighting Australians that are like, <laughs> everybody wants to play seven point. But there's like six of us that have our little mini Camlander tournaments. Nice. And it's like, yeah, okay. If I may. Thank you, Australian traders. In the Discord. Yes. The reason that I'm going to Monday Night Highlander is I have a friend who I met during the pandemic online. We raided in World of Warcraft together. Aww. And he's visiting Victoria. He's in town for 48 hours. And on his bucket list, Monday Night Highlander. It's the pilgrimage. That's, wh- that's where we're going. He's traveling from the States. And he's just like, I just want to jam a Monday yep. night. And that's so cool. So like, yeah, let's go, buddy. Mm-hmm. I changed my flight back. So I could stick another day, hang out, and play on this Monday night event. Yeah. Nice. That's sick. All right. Let's transition to the end of the episode, which means it's time for another oldie but a goodie. It's time for Powerful Magic. Oh, yeah. We did a little thing. Yeah. Wheeler, regale us with a tale of magical woe or woe. Okay. This is going to start with an L. I'll get that right out of the way, but the circumstances and what followed it mm. are extremely important. And then James, brace yourself. You're going to have to bring up so many cards, my guy. <laughs> There's one primary card that we're going to have to bring up. Uh, so I went to one of these jam sessions. There's like six of us playing just on a on a weekend or whatever for like five hours. Uh, and I brought Golgari Depths which is a black green mid range lands mid range e deck 
uh, that got so many new points. It was something that I actually played to some success uh, before the recent points changes, but it's like a lands mid-range deck, but you're actually playing Dark Depths combo, one that is occasionally left out of these mid-range decks. Um, and I had some spicy natural order targets. You had Primeval Titan, Titania, the usual suspects. I had Kogla because that's my favorite one. And then the all-star of this story, Carnage Tyrant. Carnage Tyrant is four green green for a seven, six hexproof trample can't be countered in your lands deck in my depths lands deck. Yeah. I just wanted a thing that gave a big middle finger to Jess guy. Um, this card is huge. It's difficult to get off the table. I was playing in a incredible match against pro tour day two competitor, Noel Robin, who was on his recent tournament winning, uh, Kiki Jiki seeker walk list. Uh, and we're in game two and it's gone on for like 50 minutes because I have this carnage tyrant in play and I am just like chipping away at him and his board. He has had the, he's gone through the initiative two times so far. He's about to go through a third time and I, I am not dead (laughs) because carnage tyrants ripping through him. Unfortunately, he builds up enough of a board where he kills me because on his third time going through the initiative, he hits Phyrexian Metamorph. Or no, Phantasmal Image copies my Carnage oh, Tyrant. No. With Hexproof. With Hexproof. Oh, that's yeah. incredible. Phantasmal Image, if you don't know, is oh, one in a God. blue for an illusion that comes into play, at, if you want, as a copy of any other creature, except it's also an illusion and gains when this becomes the target of a spell or ability, you have to sacrifice it. This card used to be a format staple, and then they changed how the legend rule worked, yeah. and I think it only sees play now in, like, creature combo in decks. pod lists. Combo. Or, yes. or, like, Merfolk or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So... The only way the the way that I finally lose this game is after th- going through the initiative three times, he copies my Carnage Tyrant and is able to then outmuscle my board. Um, so that's my most powerful magic story. I for that I know there's it, it ends on me losing, but I do want the folks at home to know. I then proceeded to Carnage Tyrant, uh, reanimator into the dirt. Uh, <laughs> They just couldn't. I just had a clock. I okay. just like natural order into Carnage Tyrant and like strip them. Maybe I ate one card in their graveyard and they're like, uh, yeah, I died in two hits. Uh, and Academy. I just got a uh, Canadian Highlander counselor, uh, Evan Pepper, mm-hmm. uh, was on this Academy list with counter spells and like kind of a controlling Academy list. Oh, my favorite. Carnage Tyrant. Just, <laughs> but, 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 but. Kill, you know, hitting him twice and then he dies to his own one ring trigger. Oh. Yeah, Carney T. Mm. Yeah, still yeah. in 2024. Holds up. Powerful. S- still a powerful magic. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. That's going to do it for our first actual podcast-style episode in a while. And uh, once again, to manage expectations, this was super fun. We are going to do this again going forward, but we're not going to commit to any particular schedule. So keep your eyes peeled. If you're new to the channel, make sure you're subscribed, you're following, you're doing all that sort of stuff. But uh, we'll see you when we see you, Vibes Based. I've been Serge. I've been joined by the wonderful Nelly. Hey, thanks for listening. We got Wheeler. What up? Thank you very much to James on Tech. Hello. <laughs> there we go. That yeah, was a there, ball and That was good. Yeah. Thank you so much to our editor for making this all possible. And thank you to you for your support over at the Patreon, over at patreon.com slash Run. Thank you so much for listening and or watching. And we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.